<laughs> okay, great. So thanks for the invitation to be here today. So <laughs> I, to be honest, I'm new here. I didn't know this tools and tech seminar existed. I think it's very relevant that I'm here today because I'll tell you about sort of what we're, what I'm building for my field of, of science. But I think it's, I think it should be generally interesting for people here. So today I'm going to tell you about a field that's called cryo-electron microscopy. So I'm going to motivate why we care about protein structures, and just in case people don't yet, uh, motivate that. Tell you about this technique that we use that's very powerful here at Michigan, but also sort of globally. And that I just want to point out that this was actually part of the Nobel Prize this year in 2017 in chemistry for three scientists to really help pioneer <coughs> this field. But we sort of think of it as sort of a, the field won the Nobel Prize as we've sort of arrived as a technology that lets you solve protein structures. And so you can read more on the Nobel Prize website. They have a lot of really nice summary material about the technology. So today I want to tell you about why you want to use this technology called CryoAM, and then why, if you want to use that, you now are bumping into sort of high-performance computing, follow next limitations, and then how we address that, because our user base and our field are not experts in command line and supercomputers. So how do you deal with that sort of connection, where you want to accelerate time to science for scientists, while we're moving kind of most of the things that people probably here know how to do, which is use high-performance computing, use sort of job submission, all these different things. And so I'll tell you about two stories, one using Amazon Web Services, sort of a public cloud, and also uh, a science gateway that's using Exceed resources at San Diego Supercomputing Center. So why cryoEM? So I think the modern sort of uh, part of biology research today is sort of we want to understand how things go from atoms to organisms and how that connects at a fundamental biology level, but also how disease shows up. In the, in the case where changes in mutations in proteins and parts of the cell can lead to dysregulation. And so for us, we want to know what's happening at the molecular level. And so to get us there, we start at sort of the level of the human body. What I really think about most of the time are cells. And so cells are really small compared to the human body. These are in the order of microns. A cell is made up of many compartments. These compartments are sort of packed together with lipids, proteins, DNA, RNA. And these are all moving around all the time. And so the question is, how does it all come together? And so if that's the cell, if you were to zoom in even further, you would see what in this case, illustrations would look like of what the cytoplasm of the cell, what the interior looks like. And these are all these different shapes <coughs> of proteins, macromolecule complexes that have really important cellular function. So down here, this is sort of vesicles coming in and out of the cell. This is a, probably a virus being encapsulated. And this is sort of the nucleus with DNA packed together. And the shapes of these proteins is absolutely critical for what they do. And that's the fundamental part of sort of where we are as a structural biologist, which is part of it's like stamp collecting, because we want to know what they all look like. The other part of it is sort of putting them all together and figuring out how they all come together to do these sort of amazing dynamic processes, which is sort of cell biology. So to give you sort of a flavor of this, if you just take a subset of these and try and scale them with a cell, there are these really small pieces relative to a giant cell. This is a subset from the PDB, an image from the PDB, but these are all different shapes of proteins or macromolecules. So things that you might see here that you might recognize if you're used to protein structures would be that's a virus. Uh, there's a ribosome in here somewhere, I think I saw. This is a, a proteasome that can degrade things. Uh, this is DNA, shown right here. So these are the protein shapes that, and these shapes determine protein function. Proteins are made up of amino acids. So amino acids are what you get from your food that you eat. And those are get incorporated in these specific shapes. And that's the chemistries of amino acids that determine shapes. And that's sort of the amazing part of biology is that chemistry determines shape. And so we have about 21,000 genes that maybe form you know, on the order of 100,000 different types of protein or macromolecular complexes, perhaps. And most of those structures are unknown, I would say, right now. <coughs> so that's a, a big gap in our knowledge of understanding biology. So the central dogma is that your DNA encodes a sequence of the proteins, and that if you want to say this in the context of medicine, it's mutations in DNA that then results in proteins that are doing the wrong task that then leads to some kind of disease. And so cryoEM is a tool that lets us solve protein structures using a technology that's called cryoelectron microscopy. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So why cryoEM? I'll keep talking about why, what the technology is. But really, the problem that we have is that the technology we use gives us low signal-to-noise ratio data, which I, feels like, which I feel like is everybody's problem today, which is that everybody's data is not as high signal as you'd like, and so it's sort of you now have to collect a lot of it or analyze a lot of it to overcome the low signal. So I'll tell you about why, where our low signal noise ratio comes from and why it's like that. So how do we use cryo-electron cryo microscopy to solve protein structures? 
So what this really is, is cryo-EM is transmission electron microscopy, taking images of proteins. So normally you think of this when you think of looking at cells or things in textbooks. But it turns out you can also just take purified proteins out of cells and image them with a transmission electron microscope. And so this is what the old technology, the old platform used to look like. This has been changing very quickly in the field. And so now we have much better optics, much better microscopes that are now kind of look more like a box, uh, for, fortunately. Uh, but these, this type of platform here is what we use to put our samples in to do transmission <coughs> electron microscopy of proteins. If you look at it, you'd see there's actually probably you know, 50 years of physics behind the, the optics of focusing electrons, taking images, recording images in a way that actually maintains coherent um, electrons for imaging. But we're skipping over all of that. <laughs> so let's assume that you have a microscope. And so Michigan has these, this equipment here. So that's also why it's going to talk about it here is that you know, we're, it's a great platform just for Michigan in general. OK, so cryo-EM is the idea you're going to take a support sample a uh, matrix film here, like a, a copper grid, you're going to deposit onto this protein of choice. So it could be a ribosome, virus, uh, whatever you're interested in studying, but a purified protein in this case. You put it here, you put a very thin film of, of water. In that, in that water, you actually flash freeze it so quickly that it doesn't actually form crystalline water. It just stops moving. So that's called vitreous solid. It's a form of matter. And that's like glass. So glass is a vitreous solid where it's not crystalline, but it's solid. And so cryo -EM does that. So if you freeze a thin film of water really quickly, it just stops moving. And so if your protein's purified in that buffer, what you now have is just a protein stuck in, a, in sort of some depth of water. <coughs> so if you look at the support film and zoom in, you'd have your protein of choice. So proteins are about a couple hundred angstroms in diameter about, you know, plus or minus. You get a film of water that's going to be around that thickness. So what you're trying to make is water that's about as deep as 100 to 500 angstroms, which is sort of amazing that we can even do this because that's like it's a fine number of water molecules deep. It's like you know, 100 water molecules or 300 water molecules. So it's amazing we can do this. But you can do this. You pull this thin film. You get this protein How embedded in. The freezing. What's that? How's the freezing done? So the freezing is done with you take your your protein, you put it in a grid, you blot it, then you put it into liquid ethane. So liquid ethane is a, so ethane will cool at liquid nitrogen temperatures. So since you have a, a liquid nitrogen bath, but liquid nitrogen is not very good at, it has a very low specific heat, so it doesn't really freeze things that quickly. So if you were to do this with liquid nitrogen, you just get crystal nice, because it had, the water has time to reorient to crystallize. But with liquid ethane, the specific heat is much higher, and so it actually will just stop the water from moving. So ethane, wow. propane, that type of gas, but in liquid form, is about you know, minus, minus 170 Celsius, around 70 Kelvin. Uh, so you, so you, you take your protein of choice, you embed it in this liquid, let's say you can get there, now to take images of this with electrons. And so electrons behave the same way photons do in sort of light, your eyes, but with magnets as lenses. You take images of this, and you now get where your low signal to noise ratio problem comes from. So electrons are extremely damaging. If you put a biological material in front of an electron that's a high energy electron, and you wait long enough, it just starts melting because of ionizing damage, all these different things. So you can just take your sample. Anyone who's doing this will do this at some point where you just leave your sample in the microscope too long, and suddenly you start bubbles start forming. It starts melting away. And so we have to take a really fast snapshot before it melts. And so that fast snapshot gives us the low signal problem that we have to overcome with high performance computing. Is there any contrast material or anything? So you could use contrast material, but then what you lose is actually the internal details of the protein. So in this case, the just to finish that, so what we have is we're looking at a, the scattering of electrons through the protein and into the buffer. You can fill the <coughs> intervening space with heavy metals that scatter more, but then you lose all the internal details of the protein. So it gives you that. We, we do that all the time, actually. But we just can't solve atomic structures of proteins that way because it's essentially a shell around it. But so it's also worth saying the field is we've kind of arrived. We have now better. We can solve structures of proteins. But to be honest, we're in the middle probably of our growth. We're still, there's all, always new sort of algorithm, sample prep. All these things are sort of under development, I would say, actively under development. So this is what we do today. It doesn't mean we'll be doing this in 10 years. It'll be the same ideas, but probably going to change. So this is your low signal image that you take. So it's a, it's a micrograph now of proteins. <coughs> the pixel size of your image is about an angstrom per pixel, so which is about a carbon-carbon bond, so very small pixel size. What you really have is this. So this is what it looks like, but then when you add when you actually take the image, it has a lot of noise <coughs> added. And so the problem that we have in cryo-EM is we need to take low signal data, compare all these different 
projections of a 3D object together to recover signal to actually see where all the atoms are in your protein. So the idea is you're going to extract these regions. With these extracted regions, you're going to align them together to make them all in the same orientation. You're really going to average them together or classify them. Then you'll average them together to increase the signal and then eventually go to three dimensions to get a 3D protein structure. And so this process here is we have pipelines, but this is where a lot of people are thinking now is how do you do this better and faster and, and more exhaustive. So here your reconstruction just means you can Yes. Yes, exactly. So very good point. He's pointing out that. So what you get here is the density map that you have to model in the actual atomic coordinates. And this is a model, and that's a, just modeling into density is still in and of itself a, a problem that we're trying to deal with. Oh, another problem is uh, why you can classify them? Why can't we classify them? Or why do we classify them? So why you why is possible to classify them if their like, orientation is changing continuously? Then you don't have discrete states where you can classify them. Yeah, I mean, so the classification here, in this case, we're showing in two dimensions. We will actually classify in three dimensions, and so you can't have arbitrarily sampled space. Um, but so that your question is, how is it even possible? Because considering it's discrete projections, but a continuous 3D object. And so that's where the samples that you see published today that are cryo structures are ones that can withstand this, this test of you need very fine sampling of imaging around, of projections around a 3D object. So there are some samples where you don't get equal sampling across the whole 3D space, and you won't solve the structure of it. And that's actually sort of common. And we just, it's just not published. And so we have lots of samples <laughs> like that that are what you, what you get is sort of an anisotropic view or distribution of views of your sample, and then you're just stuck. And then you have to change your buffer and start doing these things <clears throat> to fix it. But it works for some of these. And so the, the sampling ends up being enough. Uh, but I think we're all slightly surprised that it worked as well as it does now, I would say. Because it is true, it's discrete. So part of what we part of this so damage to deal with damage, we can take very short movies. But it turns out vitreous, <laughs> vitreous ice, this frozen ice, isn't actually solid. It's not like glass where it's actually not moving. When it's vitreous and being kept at this cold temperature, it still moves a little bit. And so it turns out the big revolution in cryo EM about three or four years ago was the ability to actually take a really fast movie. So it's not just an image with a fast <laughs> movie where you're can go up to you know 100 frames per second or 40 frames per second. And so instead of an image, you take a movie. And with that movie, you can now reconstruct any kind of movements that happened. So you can imagine that if you're trying to reconstruct where atoms are in your protein, if that moved by you know an atom or two, that's going to blur out that part of the structure, and you won't be able to actually solve that part. And so part of what we do now is we take these movies. And that's sort of also how you sort of put ourselves into closer to the big data fields. Uh, so if this is what you're imaging. This is, a say, a protein structure you're imaging. We take a really fast movie where every raw frame is actually very low signal. And what we're going to do is align these movies together to actually recover signal. So in this case, if you were to sort of go through, and you're, there's different ways of doing this, but you align these together, and you actually will recover the signal. And what you get is a, a higher quality version of your image, whereas before, you probably just had a snapshot that was moving. Now this is more crisp details. And that's what lets us solve structures to high resolution. And so what that means is that our, the movies we get from the microscope are around either 4,000 pixels by 4,000 pixels or 8,000 pixels by 8,000 pixels times 40 frames. And we collect that about one per minute, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so each one of these movies is about 1 to 10 gigabytes. <clears throat> and then you do that. A data set that you need is about 3,000 of those just for a pilot data set. So for instance, yesterday we were collecting a pilot data set overnight. That was about 2 terabytes just to see what's going to happen. And that's not even a final data set. That's just like a screening data set. And so that's sort of where we're bumping in as a field into this problem of like data storage. We're not deleting these movies because we can still analyze these better and differently with new algorithms. So there's every cryo-EM lab has about you know half a petabyte of data just sitting around that usually not on cold storage and like active storage because we don't know what to do with it. OK, so just to kind of recap that, the idea is you take your protein. You're putting in a, this is a side on view of a sample here. So your protein suspended in some sort of you know, 200 or 300 angstrom thick water that's frozen. You're taking an image with electrons. You get, this is now a real image from the microscope. And so what this is, this is actually a very pure protein. And this looks like you can't see anything. Uh, because it's low signal and because it's sort of crowded and proteins aren't perfect spheres, they all kind of touch each other and stick sometimes. And so in white here are shown example proteins that you can isolate. 
Um, other things you see, that's like a crystalline ice contaminant. Um, so that's what it looks like when it's crystalline. There's other things that can show up. Um, so to walk you through these steps, this is what the raw data looks like. You're going to collect about half a million to a million of these subset, of these sort of <coughs> subregions, these individual proteins, or we also call them particles in cryo-EM. You take this, you're going to subtract them, extract them out, and then you're going to start averaging them together with high-performance computing resources. So that can be CPU-based, or we also have GPU-accelerated soft uh, code that can run on GPU workstations. Uh, but you now take these and you average them together, and when it's actually, when you're averaging the same object and it's working, you get things that look like this, where you're increasing the signal to noise of your, of your data, of your image, compared to the input data. So things are working. These are in two dimensions, and you really, you really want this in three dimensions. And so what you will then will do is go into 3D analysis. And so we, we can also do classification in 3D. So the idea is you can do sort of a computational purification of your data to find substates of your, of your protein of choice. Because for people who maybe know this, proteins are usually not static. Usually they're changing conformations or they're doing something. So usually a lot of the times you, you care about what it's doing. So it means how does it go from state A to state B? So CryoAM can let you actually answer that from the same data set in the sense that you can come in and say, well, Here's a global view of it, and now let's sort it into substates. And then you, with that, you can sort of interpret what's going on. So in this case, let's say you start with sort of some starting point, some starting model. You then start grouping it into three dimensions using different types of analysis, analysis algorithms. You take this, and you can do it sort of subsequently. So if anyone who looks at cryo papers today, what you'll see are these sort of hierarchical trees and supplemental figures, because they're sort of using computers to purify the data into substates. What you see is that when you start it off, there's sort of it's kind of blobby and lower feature. For anyone who's used to looking at protein structures down here, you now start seeing alpha helices, and you're actually kind of getting at high, you're sorting things correctly and increasing the precision of each model as far as representing a single state. Because you can imagine that this state here was a mixture of substates, and you actually separate them out into three different states, and then you can get higher higher resolution. So you can go through this further and sort of iteratively in many many steps, and you can get to structures where this isn't atomic. This one is a real data set that's harder to analyze. Um, but what you see are these are all alpha helices. And you see these bumps on the alpha helices are sort of features of amino acid side chains. Um, and so this is filtered at a number here called five angstroms, which means we can't see all the atoms, but we can see sort of secondary structure elements. And this gets at your question, which is modeling protein density is <coughs> tricky if you don't know where every amino acid side chain actually is. And that's where software programs like your lab works on is really helpful to have sort of iTaser or Rosetta or different pipelines to sort of help you kind of use chemical knowledge to model your protein besides just the density map. And so what we get, besides having a structure, we actually can infer sort of stable regions or flexible regions. Because you can imagine we're reconstructing a state. These are sort of, this structure here is probably from 50,000 different images. You can imagine that some images have a static part of the structure and some are maybe flexible. And you actually will get that in your map where you can color it by local resolution, we call it, which is that you know, this part down here is more flexible, which is lower resolution, whereas some parts that are more stable, <coughs> that average together constructively, are higher resolution. So is this similar to being that it's similar to B factor in crystallography, but the, the actual scale of the differences can be much more. I think a B factor in crystallography is pretty narrow because it's sort of an uncertainty parameter around where one atom is or one side chain is. In this case, this is saying the uncertainty here is on the order of an alpha helix almost of moving back and forth, which is, I think, a much bigger displacement than you could probably have in a B factor, but analogous idea. Unfortunately, it's not as well formulated as a B factor is, though. This is sort of just saying it's <coughs> this is local resolution, whereas a B factor is like you actually can you know, go to your diffraction spots and understand. Just I, I want to show you some other examples of raw data so you kind of see what it looks like. So on the left here is an amazing data set of beta galact It's a sample called beta galactosidase. Um, it was published a couple years ago from a lab at the NIH. What this is is, a, again, a purified protein. And each one of these here is, is a protein of interest. And that on the right here, I show an image where we've selected out the areas that will take the further analysis. So you can see these are clumping together, for instance. They're not, they're not monodisperse. Uh, but either way, we still can start analyzing it. Another image. So again, really, the images that we get are noisy. But we can sort of try to overcome that. Sorry, you are picking those particles? You are yeah. going to find that? So some, some people still do that manually. Most people do it automatically now, or some kind of semi-automated way. But there are you can look in some methods, and some people just will do it manually because they're sort of resistant to change. <laughs> <laughs> but so because you can imagine these, these, so part of our field is actually how do you identify subregions automatically, reproducibly, 
and sort of avoid sort of pitfalls where these are probably pretty good images, but there's lots of images where there's like a big aggregate or there's contamination. There's sort of things that you don't want to pick, but a lot of algorithms actually pick because they can't discern it very well. So there's a lot of people in our field are just focusing on this problem. It's, it's like, you know, a, a lot of things that you see today in Cryome are sort of like <clears throat> half solved. Like we definitely, proof of concept works, but to actually make them more robust is sort of the next phase, I think. So if you took this data and then sort of, in this case, it was about 130,000 particles from 1,500 of these sort of micrographs. You start averaging them together, you get things that are now higher signal to noise ratio where you can start seeing features that are related to the secondary structure of the protein. Again, to show you the raw data, this is for this image here, these are actually aligned projections that went into this exact one. So you kind of can tell, like, you know, these bottom two are about the right shape, uh, but these are, it's harder to see. Uh, so that's part of what the, the analysis is doing. Finally, if you sort of push that all the way to the end and solve and determine this protein structure, this one goes to one of the highest ones that we have in the field, which is around 2.2 angstroms, which means that you see densities that looks like this, which is near perfect when it comes to this, especially for this field. And you can start seeing water molecules and sort of coordinating ions. It's very impressive. Most don't go this high. So that's just a caveat. Uh, but this is a sort of a model sample that's it's been a really nice proof of concept for all of these. Protein is that? Beta galactosidase. So it's also fourfold symmetric, which helps a lot. Uh, so it's just it's sort of a rock of a sample. OK, so now I'll kind of talk about the approaches that we took to dealing with this. So let's say you can imagine the problem now. So there are lots of biochemists who are like, I have a really pure protein. I want to solve a protein structure. I don't need to grow crystals. I just need to take it, put it in the microscope, and it gives me a structure. But the problem is, you're like, oh, well, here's your 15 terabytes of data. You don't have a data server, probably, because you're a biochemist, or maybe you're an X-ray crystallographer. Also, don't, not a data intensive field, so that they have maybe a terabyte of storage for everything. And you're like, your first data set out of like probably five is going to be 15 terabytes. Start analyzing it. So the problem is this for us, which is that people have samples that probably can be solved, and they want to learn it, but they don't have the, the data, infra the cyber infrastructure to do it themselves. So the question is, do you make everybody purchase and buy in a data storage, or are there other ways of sort of approaching this from a, you know, a cloud or remote resource perspective? And so I'm on the side of trying to push this to remote resources, but there are lots of labs where you can do it in-house and just spend the money. But the question is, if you don't have the money, what can you do? Or are there other ways to do it that are more cost effective? So I would say state-of-the-art cryo-EM is this, which is that you have these amazing microscopes, one of which we have here at Michigan, and you just go through this sort of mess of Linux-based custom scripts, custom data movement things, and then you get a structure. And so you get amazing structures, but in between, there's all these homemade things that sort of stand in the way to new users coming into the field. At the same time, so number of users are going up. I would say expert level of knowledge is going down, and then probably cyber infrastructure available for that user is also going down. And so this is the problem that we're trying to face, we're trying to deal with. So how do you do this? So I, if you think about this, you could be a really wealthy institute laboratory and just be like, okay, <laughs> we're going to drop, you know, $100,000, $200,000 on really nice data storage that's backed up and then computing resources and pay for an admin to maintain it and all those things. That's just very expensive. And so this is possible. And most cryo labs are like this right now because they're sort of the first one at their university. But then when you have, so here at Michigan, we've talked to probably 20 different labs that want to do this. We don't have storage for everybody or computing for everybody. And so again, that's the issue. Uh, so <laughs> university-wide, you know, this is okay. Like Michigan has a computing center here, but it turns out we have really high memory requirements, and pretty much the super <clears throat> the high performance computing here is not great for us. It's also it costs money, which is it's, it's like maybe cheaper than Amazon or other resources, but it's not so cheap that it makes you want to use it. Uh, other things could be national supercomputing centers through through the Exceed or NSF. The nice thing there, you can get free computing if you kind of can stay on top of the applications and get approved. Uh, but there's no data storage, no long-term data storage exactly through that. So what are the other ways? So one way is using cloud computing through Amazon or Google. And today I'll talk about Amazon. And so what I did as part of a postdoc and now transitioning to my independent lab here at Michigan is building a software package to mostly handle Amazon web services for analyzing cryo-EM data. So moving your data up and running it. And at the end I'll talk about a web-based platform that I built that's we're about to release hopefully soon. Um, that's built on NSF supercomputers. Did the astronomy or particle physics communities have any hints of things to do or not do? You know, 
And it, it'd be nice to talk to more of them. I think I'm not talking to enough of them. I've talked to a few physicists. It seems like they mostly use NSF supercomputers. They don't usually invest in their own supercomputer, I think. But I think you're right, though, that they're really data intensive. And so we can look to other fields for how to deal with this. I think we're like the order of magnitude isn't quite as big as them. So we're sort of somewhere in between those two. The guy in physics that works on the, I guess the Atlas detector at the LHC. Mm. I can't remember his name. Mm. I see him biking to work. Okay, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I think we've learned a lot. Is a senior guy. What's that? Homer Neal is our senior person at Virginia. Uh, about a, a junior faculty member who's not cutting edge. Uh, he, he runs one of the regional, along with Michigan State, they have a joint mm. thing. I just, his name yeah, is in my brain somewhere. I think you're right, though, that we need to start <coughs> to page that out of people's playbooks. Because right now, the, the problem is sort of a practical one. Yeah? Sean McKee. Sean McKee, okay. Mm. The problem is a practical one because we all want to publish papers and not spend the time to actually think about infrastructure. To, uh, so. Yeah. But the incentives are also towards publishing. <laughs> Yeah. So just to make sure on the same page, I put this audience kind of knows this, but so the cloud does everything sort of in our world around us today. Uh, but for people who don't know, Amazon Web Services is one of the longest ones and most established cloud providers for everything that relates to websites, data storage, and, and computing. And so you know we all are up here at what they call the application cloud. When you're watching Netflix, is like you're just looking at things. Um, the question is, can you plug into the bottom and just go straight to the machines and do your tasks yourself? So the answer is yes. You just have to sort of do it and figure out how to do it and pay for it. Michael? Yes. Uh, I've got a message from Brian. Great. OK. He says he's a co-PI on the NSF computing resource. Give you more information. OK. Great. <coughs> Very good. Thanks. OK. So the reasons you might use cloud computing are you're paying per minute. For your resources. <coughs> There's no upfront costs. And so in this case, it's per minute, pay as you go. You're paying for everything, though. And some academics don't like that. But essentially, industry has moved to the cloud a, a while ago. Um, academics are really resistant to this. Uh, reliable backup storage. I think there's actually, this is hard to capture how reliable this is relative to your, your local machines that are duplicated in the same room. I think that's not very reliable. Most people don't have very reliable storage. This is extremely reliable because it's all over the world usually duplicated. And they measure how reliable it is. Um, the nice thing here is flexibility. So if you build a software tool into Amazon, you can then distribute it all over the world and put it in data centers next to other scientists. And so it makes it actually easy to distribute really complicated workflows routines, whereas otherwise it's sort of all these custom installation things. For people who don't know, Amazon's all over the world. They keep ad adding new data centers. So in the US, there's Ohio, Virginia, Oregon, uh, San Francisco, and then Seattle. But they're things, they, they keep opening all of the all over the world. These data centers have all different types of virtual machines in them, um, and it just keeps changing and growing and getting cheaper. <clears throat> so just to make sure people know, it's also, I think, kind of informative for the audience to see what they actually have. There are different extremes in Amazon for the type of machines that you want. There are these sort of half CPU machines that are tiny, that can do like barely a task. Uh, but that's, those are very cheap. Those are less than a penny per hour. Then you have very fancy ones that are, you know, on the order of 100 CPUs machines with a lot of RAM, and these cost like $13 an hour. And so these prices are what you pay for. Yeah. One more comment from Brian. We have a business agreement with AWS now that you will going research with good discount, good discount price. Right. So yeah, I'm, I, I'm hopefully taking advantage of that because I am using the system level agreement with Amazon. But yeah, that's good. Good to know. Okay, so an example here, so those are two extremes. There's like lots of in-between computing resources here. So there's more CPUs versus RAM. There's more RAM versus CPUs. They also have lots of GPUs. In this case, these are K80 GPUs. Um, they also have the P100 GPUs. They also have, there's lots of things here. Um, so there's many different types. You sort of pick your type of project, and it's there. That's what's nice for, especially for cryogenic workflows, we have lots of different requirements per task that we're doing. It's not just a single machine. And so you can sort of pick and choose the flavors. Uh, so to give you an example, the order of magnitude of prices here, the most expensive is about $13 to $14 an hour, and the cheapest is less than a penny per hour. <coughs> Just to point out storage, there's sort of the storage on the machine that you're using. There are sort of SSD type storage you can move around that you pay sort of some number per gigabyte per month. I just want to point out this name here. It's called S3, or Simple Storage Service. This is one that's extremely reliable, and you pay this amount per gigabyte per month. Uh, I'm pointing this out because I'll mention this name later. But just so we know, there's different types of storage. Details don't matter that much. 
So we originally showed a few years ago, this actually works for CryoEM. We could, in this case, we were spinning up CPU clusters on Amazon. It worked. People, it was maybe slightly expensive, but it also definitely worked. And so, but since then, we realized this old system we did was really manual and kind of cumbersome. And so what we did was we wrapped this up into sort of a, a software package. So cumbersome, Linux experience required. So honestly, if you think about the cloud, no one really cares about how, what's actually happening in the cloud. You just care about the results that you get or what you're doing. And so if you're using Dropbox or using whatever, you just want to do it from your computer and not care, not really know what's going on in the back end. So that's sort of what we built. We took that as inspiration. So the idea is you as a user just want to send your laptop or your computer and submit your jobs and something else has all of the, the magic of using the cloud for you and brings the results back to you. And that's what we did. We, we sort of wrote, used the command line language of Amazon to write this interface here. And so what we did is we took the most popular software in CryoEM. It's called RelyOn. Uh, it's very powerful software. This is already set up to run on top of computing clusters. And so we can kind of come in and sort of plug into their cluster submission routine and just say, like, instead of going to a cluster, like, call our code and just go to Amazon. So it's actually very easy to integrate directly into the user interface. So users don't have to know what's going on. They see this, the exact same output files. Everything is the same. But it's actually going to Amazon instead. And so again, there's this cluster submission feature here. And now user just says yes. They select our software, and they hit run, and then just goes to Amazon. So I think it's a nice paradigm also for sort of you know, data intensive fields, which is that I think users really like this, where it's not changing anything about their their day to day computing, but that in this, in this case, it's all syncing back in real time. So everything is, is local, but also running on Amazon. So there's many steps. This, these are all the steps in the pipeline to solve the structure. There's like a zillion steps. Here. <laughs> so I took every step here and put it into the software code. So you, depending on what you pick, it, it hits go, it goes to my software, it says, oh, you're trying to do this task. Oh, we want these types of machines or these types of machines. It sort of does some kind of deciding for users. Because again, users don't know the computing on Amazon, how to move data to Amazon fast, all these sort of things, and we can handle that for them. Yeah. So is that behind the scenes, like spinning up instances and starting on them and mm -hmm. shutting them down when it's done? Yeah, cool. yeah. So it's all, and the, the nice thing is, you know, there's a command line language for Amazon, so it's really easy to just sort of learn it. Um, but then, yeah, it's sort of monitoring things, monitoring when the job finishes, moving data around. And so related to that is that you, know, you run the job from your computer. You start up the virtual machine or what they call them instances. But it turns out the fastest way to move data is through these is through S3. They're sort of lock storage options. And this is this where it gets more, if you were an end user, you probably wouldn't figure out how to move data to S3 and down to your machine. You'd probably just SCP it or something to your instance. And that's the slowest way to move data to Amazon. So it's nice for this sort of work works into sort of probably the best data movement practices you could get. Um, you're still limited by your, your networking. So bad networking means low uploads. Um, Michigan has good networking, as long as your computer's in the right backbone. So, so what kind of times are we talk like 15 terabytes of data? So you're usually, for, for me here, it's about a terabyte an hour upload, which is about 300 megabytes per second. Multi-file uploads to S3. So, you it's know, quick. it's not bad. It's like pretty good. Uh, it still take would take like a day or like an afternoon, depending. <clears throat> Honestly, if you were fully into the Amazon system, every file is about a gigabyte. It takes about a minute to collect. It would probably take about a minute to move it up to Amazon. So you probably could do it in real time if you were actually full, really thinking about it. No one's there yet right now, but you could probably just do it on the fly. And it would be as bad. So that's the 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 high level thinking. I just want to walk you through sort of what actually happens in the back end to show you. But the idea is you're on your laptop and you're hopefully not a laptop, hopefully not Wi-Fi, hopefully like a real network connection. And you have, let's say, 15 terabytes of data. You hit run for this step called the movie alignment or the raw data alignment step. And this, like I was telling you, it's about a terabyte an hour, you know, this type of speed where I'm getting on good networking. It goes to S3. And in this case, this is a GPU or, sorry, this one is actually a CPU accelerated step. It's 1,500 files of movies move around. Oh. And so you want to just sort of do it as fast as possible. So that means spin up five of these really big machines and just run it. And so in this case, you can run this step that normally takes you know, 24 hours locally in an hour on Amazon. You have to upload it there. But it does it really fast because you can get as many resources as you need. Yeah. What's the advantage of making this like a local client rather than web-based? Uh, the advantage is mostly that the user, so the question, I guess, for the audience in, online is the question is why why a client versus a web interface? It's because the software that everybody uses and is comfortable with is a local client. So you could abstract it all the way, and that's the later part of my talk. But I think you're going to get people who like, you're not changing anything about the software. 
that people are using. So it's nice that they can learn the software and not to learn my software as well, or it's sort of like a single step. So I think that's the feature though, is a web-based client. So yeah, these diagrams are all detailed related to Amazon, so there's sort of security settings, all these things that I can sort of set up on the fly when you launch it. Uh, so in this case, it took two hours, whereas normally this would probably take 36 hours locally. Uh, so ran really nice. So I apologize for some of the cryoEM terms that are going to be sprinkled in here. Um, you do different steps. In this case, you're going to select the areas out. This is a CPU-based step. Uh, there's other steps now that are going to be GPU accelerated, where there's different types of classification alignment. We can use the there's many GPU machines. You use those GPU machines. And again, all these cases are syncing it back to your computer. I think every 10 or 20 seconds, it's syncing it back. So it's, it's, it's sort of, it feels like it's running locally. A few more steps that are CPU based. It's worth pointing out there's a couple steps here where we have to take the whole data set, which is 15 terabytes, download it to an instance, and then extract all these subregions out. And they have machines that can hold up to 42 terabytes per machine. So you kind of can like actually handle really data intensive steps. That, this actually is a bottleneck for local machines, usually, is this type of step. And so this is sort of the overall idea, is that this software package has all these different steps. My software can sort of do any of it that you need and, and can run it without users ever sort of seeing what's going on in the background. They just see the output. To give you a sense of what this is, so someone had analyzed the same data set I'm about to talk about using a GPU-accelerated workstation. So this is a four GPU machine with GTX 1070s, uh, with 16 CPU cores. So it's, it's a, they can do it in 115 hours, every step of this pipeline. So that's, that's really impressive, the fact that GPU accelerated really helped a lot. Before, this had to be on a CPU cluster. It's a big step just to have a GPU. But everybody's buying this, so the question is, how does Amazon compare to this? And so I took the same data set, and you can do it in sort of less than half the time. It's not, you know, it's not, it'd be nice if it was faster. If it was an order of magnitude faster, that'd be better. Half as fast is still nice. Uh, but the, really, the, the take-home point here for CryoEM is that we can do it faster than you can on a local machine, but we also can do it sort of arbitrarily scalable, whereas this machine is sort of one person, one job at a time. This can be as many jobs at a time. And so that's sort of the take-home point, not that Amazon's necessarily going to solve everything faster because the code itself is sort of limiting in a lot of different steps. I guess that, uh, I guess, you know, the next slide, I was going to say, 55 hours, what, what's the price point at the bottom? So the price point for this so I'm not going to go into the so Amazon has all these pricing. There's these sort of bidding things. I'm not using the bidding part. So the price can always be cheaper, but the sort of ticket price for this would be, um, this was, I think, around $700. So it's not like it's 20 bucks or 50 bucks. It's like a, a chunk of money. It's also the full pipeline here. And to be honest, most people probably wouldn't use it for the full pipeline, but hundreds of dollars sort of per attempt at this. And you, so you could still spend thousands of dollars on Amazon. And so that's sort of where the field is right now. We're trying to figure out, like, when is it worth it to do this? When is it worth it to buy a local resource? And I think there's probably the solution is like both. You buy some local, and then when, but you don't wait. So the, the point is here, every step here, the most expensive steps here cost maybe $13 an hour. That's cheaper than all of our hourly salary, salaries. So if you're going to wait overnight for someone else's job to complete, you could have finished on Amazon in that time, and you would have saved yourself. So I think it gets these economic arguments that academics kind of hate. And so it's kind of this. It's in this sort of murky area right now. I think industry loves this idea because they already are on board with the cloud. They know to not maintain local resources. And so, so I think right now the biggest target audience here are going to be big labs, big facilities. There's some cryoEM facilities in the country that are 100 users. So like you're, how do you, you buy 100 workstations? And that still won't be enough. You know, to, so they like the cloud as well. I think that's the use. If you're like a one-person lab and you're like, I'm in my own lab. I'm going to solve my own structures. So I'm not going to do multiple structures at once. I'm doing one at a time, serial processing, followed by a GPU workstation or something like that. It's also worth pointing out the, the code is running, is developing really quickly. And like last year, a new software package came out that's CPU based. And so if you would invest in GPUs, it'd be slower for you to use the CPU ones. Now. So it's sort of this whole thing. The field is moving so quickly that actually using the cloud is kind of nice because it means you have to commit to some sort of big infrastructure investment. So besides the actual cryoEM structure <coughs> determination, people like modeling atomic density, atomic models into the density maps. And so we picked Rosetta because this is one of the software packages that we also had experience with. So Rosetta is a very powerful modeling software, actually really hard to use. Uh, if anyone's tried to use it, it's kind of awful to use. And so part of the added value you can get from the cloud is you can take normal input files from users and run tasks for them. Whereas Rosetta requires a lot of sort of dense things not very well documented, that we can sort of wrap that up and make it easy to use. 
And so part of this, so in this case, Rosetta, same idea. This is arbitrarily scalable because it's sort of one CPU gets one task. It's not as complicated as cryo EM analysis. Um, so it means we can scale it really well. I think the bigger reason to use this is honestly that this is actually maybe more affordable. It gets done much faster than you doing yourself locally. Um, so it can go way faster because you can sort of just ask for as many CPUs as you want. Um, but what you get is our software package doing steps for you that are easy steps that are, you would do anyway, but does it for you. So that, that's kind of nice. Um, so I think that's where the cloud also steps in, where you can add value to pipelines and things that users probably wouldn't try and do it on their, on their own. OK, so this is sort of the, for me, the take home point was this, that you want to, if you're running software for people who aren't experts in the field, you want to do something like this, where you're sort of abstracting away things that are not actually related to the science being done, because people just want to do science faster, I think is the take home point. And so this lets you do that. You have to pay for it, and people don't like that. We have to pay for it, but you can do it faster. Um, and that's sort of where we are, and we're sort of expanding it to other software packages and thinking about how this goes in the future. OK, so the last thing I'll talk about is like just a few slides. It's to highlight this other approach of sort of remote cloud computing-based uh, project here. So this is, so I started a project that we're calling Cosmic 2 or Cosmic Squared for a long acronym that mostly, the idea is it's a cryo-EM website that will analyze your data on a supercomputer all without seeing a command line. And so that's sort of the, the task that you're charged with is a user's going to show up with 15 terabytes of data. You need to be able to upload it, ingest it, and run it without, with, so you can't use any normal data moving protocols. You have to do something else and you have to move it to a supercomputing center. And so this is something that the IT people are already doing, the Science Gateway. So Science Gateway is a term that's sort of becoming popular, which is a, it's this website that links users to supercomputing resources. So we're sort of in the same, same idea as, as ITaser. And so the idea is users come in with their data. We're going to move it, in this case, the, as a first case, to the San Diego Supercomputing Center. And then with this, we'll be, they can be executing algorithms and choices that whatever they want to do. So short term, we just wanted to get people into the supercomputing center to run their jobs without us coming in and telling them what to do. Just here's a resource through a website, run it. And that required sort of removing all these job commands and sort of centralizing software packages. Because it turns out if you look at CryoEM listservs right now, most of the questions are just like computing problems and like, like uh, um, their workstation issues, job running issues, are sort of like just new users learning how to run things. So we can remove all that. And this would also be free because using NSF exceed resources. So academics would really like a free resource. Uh, so long term, you really like to connect people to storage and computing, be a place where you could actually implement new algorithm and new pipelines. So it's like sort of a clearinghouse of cryoEM software. And then also probably integrate educational materials as people are coming into the field to sort of teach them about the different steps. So we're at the point now where we've built it and we're just sort of debugging it, really debugging it right now. But the big thing that we implemented was through, so through Xseed, we got developer time to really integrate the software package called Globus, which probably people here have heard of because Michigan uses them. But people who don't know, Globus is a, it's a big data moving platform, but also sharing as well. Uh, but the idea is this can handle, this can integrate into websites. And users can interact with their data through a website and then sort of let Globus then move the data between the servers. So to walk you through this, the idea is a user goes to a website. They already have the software connect uh, an endpoint connect or installed on their local laptop data server. Through the website, they then can interact with their data storage and say, move this directory file. You click it, Globus then goes, grabs it, and then moves it to where it's going. So in this case, for our website, users don't choose where they go where it goes. They just say, like, send it to Cosmic for me, because then when we'll grab it and ingest it. But the idea is users come in click Globus, and then we can ingest it. And we can ingest you know, as much data as you throw at us. You can upload it to, you know, there's no, Globus can move petabytes if they need to. So it's not an issue of actually data moving. The nice thing with Globus that it's doing all the file checking and integrity checks that you'd want in a data moving service. So it's really nice. You sort of can outsource all that to Globus. So, so you need to uh, customize the Globus code. So in this case, we had to, so they have, there's a Globus API that we did that we edited. And so I didn't do that myself. We used someone at SDSC to do that. Um, but so everything we built is online in a GitHub repo. But Globus is very supportive because because Globus is kind of a half academic, half industry. So it was developed at University of Chicago. So they kind of like use cases and like people getting into it. So it's an API and they have all the documentation online. You can sort of learn how to use it. It seemed Bobby not Grossman. that. What's that? Robert Grossman. Um, perhaps. I'm not sure that is. 
but but yeah, so I think it's pretty straightforward to use, and it's actually very nice. And we're just using the data moving part. There's data sharing. There's all these different things you can do with it. They also connect to cloud storage, so Google Box, um, Amazon, they can connect to as well. So it lets you move data at different locations. So we're on top of SDSC because the gateway is actually being hosted on a virtual machine at, at SDSC. So that's where we started. But once you're in the Exceed network, you're in now really amazing uh, networking between all the supercomputers in the country. So the idea is that we're just going to start pushing jobs other places depending on what we need and what the type of job is. Uh, so again, there's high speed networking between supercomputing centers. So it's going to be really nice to be able to choose where this goes next. Currently, just SDSC, though. So the idea is users are going to land and be able to log into our website. And that once they're in here, they then can have a really rudimentary website for interacting with their data. And so I think I'd cut out. Let me just sort of show you a few slides over here. So I cut these out because I wasn't sure how long this is going to take. I'll just show you one thing. So the nice thing about Globus is that when you click login, they use the, it's, uh, it's called the, I forget it's called, it's a password sharing service for allowing you to authenticate with remote, with sort of Google, universities, other authenticator, authentication sites. So the idea is if you click login, you say, I want to authenticate with University of Michigan, it drops you off at your Michigan, you know, normal Kerberos website here. Once there's sort of a, a handshake that says, Mike authenticated, OK, come on in. And so then that lets you into our website. So it also removes all user management, password management, security to Globus, which means moving it to the university. So it's the other nice thing with Globus that it removes that problem for us to deal with. So the actual web interface is very bare bones. Just to show you what it looks like, when you move your data sets in, they're going to be coming in as sort of these kind of files on a list. This is all where we're going to be improving in the future. But the idea is users can come in. They can execute the jobs they want, which are these type of reliant jobs. They hit run, and it submits to comments and brings them back sort of output text files for now. And then they can sync it back down with Globus. So Globus is syncing things. So you sort of, you're essentially syncing your home directory to our computer, supercomputing, gateway. Then it's going to sync it all back. So you have the files are sort of changing and updating. So it's very nice. And so we're, it isn't available yet. We're about to make it available. Um, for you. Another message from Brian. OK. Use it all the time and help others with it. We are close to its creator, Ruby Foster, whose daughter is now a freshman. <laughs> Great. Yeah, Globus is very powerful <laughs> software, so it's very nice. Uh, so, everything we did, we, we, for people who are interested in, this, in using this Globus integration, I think people would like that. Um, but, you know, we can talk more later and we, we have it. But so now we're getting to the point now where it's going to be the user management side of this project which is that we're going to get an exceed allocation to the cosmic science gateway, and we get to now distribute it. And so we currently have you know, 25,000 GPU hours. And so the question is going to be, how do you let users, users don't want you to force them to do anything. They want to be able to choose everything themselves. But you also probably have to have some hand to make sure they don't submit things that are going to use up all of their allocation or all of yours. And so that's where we are right now is kind of you know, setting this up so users can come in, authenticate with Globus, and then we have sort of a database we're keeping track of everything and seeing how much time a user is using. And so it's nice because it lets you divide up time, but then we're going to have to cut off people, I think. Um, but because we're in Exceed, if a user comes to us already with an Exceed allocation, we can use that allocation as well. So it's, it's nice in that respect. So we're going to remove some administrative bottlenecks by just giving them time for free. But then if it is a big cryo-EM lab or a facility is like, oh, we want to have this many hours on Exceed, we already have it. We can just plug it in, no big deal. What we're also talking about is this is, so the gateway right now is being funded through NSF, uh, sort of grant mechanism from SDSC. Long term, that's not sustainable. And so you have to turn your gateway into some kind of sustainable business consortium platform. And so what's nice with Exceed is that you can pay per, t industry can pay per time, or per computing, computing cycle. And so we're thinking about how to bring on industry partners who want to do cryo -EM. They can They can pay, and they can, we sort of can, figure out a way to have them get access to sort of our expertise in cryo-EM, but also sort of fund the gateway to stay open. So that's where we think we need to think next. Um, but you know, we're, this is a work in progress. I think this is an exciting time. I think it's going to really move a lot of people here, because there's people who are trying to use Amazon, trying to do it locally. I think people would rather just do it like this and get, get it done and not worry about any of this. So can you tell a part of protein that's plus 4 related and not plus 4 related, a stoichiometric mixture in the same sample? Right, so the question is, related to the protein structure determination, what can we tell? So 
if I took an image of your sort of stoichiometric mixture of with and without phosphorylation, the raw image we couldn't tell because it's so noisy. But when we start analyzing it, if there's any structural difference, we, we could see it. If it's honestly just a phosphate that's been added, you might be able to see it, but so it also might get discreet. If it's just very, it's very discreet. You knew where it was. Yeah, I know. So in principle, yes. In practice, it depends on like what signal is going to be driving. What about splice isoforms? So splice isoforms. So can you find splice isoforms? Uh, probably. Again, it gets that sort of the analysis algorithms are, are using are really doing kind of template based alignment of things. So the bigger, the more dominant part of the protein is going to drive alignments. And so if you're looking for something that's really subtle. And you don't know where it is, for instance, in the structure, you might miss it. If it's like really flexible, you wouldn't see it. Or so I'd say in principle, yes. Of some of these. In principle, yes. I mean study. if you look at <coughs> papers coming out on sort of spliceosomes or ribosomes where they're sort of they get a structure part of it and they sort of say, Oh, this part's flexible, moving, we can then classify that and it gets into mostly sort of the science of your project, but in principle, yes, these are all doable. It still would be hard, but it's all doable. Oh, you so, you yeah. just say it's GPU hours, but how much storage you ask for? And yeah, so the, the, for the storage part, we're starting off with 10 terabytes on Comet. And the reality is, I didn't talk about this, but we're, we're mostly going to feed into the later stages of analysis. So users only have, only have 50 to 100 gigabytes per user. So it means they can't give you the raw image. Not they, yet. They must give you the electron density map. They, they must give us sort of a pre-processed data where it's been extracted and aligned. The goal is to do the whole thing. And so that's where we're interested in the scratch storage on Comet, because that's petabyte scratch storage. <laughs> sort of dumping data there while it's being sort of pre-processed and then and getting it at, back out. But you're right, we have to sort of figure out how to do this. Cause we pay, so we actually have storage on Comet. That's 10 terabytes. We pay to use that. We pay to reserve that for ourselves. But we need to figure out what that should be. Should it be 100 terabytes? Shared and that's the next, yeah. So, Administrative things are non trivial part of this is figuring out how to actually do it. So, you mean you can actually buy an Oasis place for you? Yeah, so it's, it's on Oasis. We have sort of our own little corner that's 10 terabytes that's ours for now. I mean, you pay, you, you pay for it. It didn't seem that bad. How much? I have a question. I can here. tell you, but I, I, yeah. I forget. I can tell you later. Though. I'm just curious how many uh, proteins you can analyze with the current. You know, resources with with this, with yeah. 20, yeah. Um, it seems like about let's say one run of your analysis. Let's say you have your extracted data and you're going to run it. It's probably in the order of 200 to 400 GPU hours for for one attempt. This is an attempt, not like the actual okay. final one. So this is going to be in the hopefully in the order of like structures. You know, hopefully like I mean it is like a few hundred. Yeah, a few hundred. Was a pilot allocation because then we'll go back to XC and be like, look how popular we were. Give us like ten million. Yeah, and they'll, they'll say no, and then yeah, most know. people from us haven't done nothing. Yeah, yeah. So right now this is sort of a seed funding. This would get you off the ground for sure. And then we're gonna keep. I think the idea is we're gonna keep some of this aside and be able to have our own kind of supplemental application for users. Because again, the application process of XSEED is like they really try and help you do it, but still certain times of the year it's kind of cumbersome. And so we want to try and like. Remove that cumbersome aspect and mm -hmm. without, but the problem is if they have our own checks in place, make sure people aren't wasting our time. And so I think that's where we will have in our pipeline. There's going to be steps that are going to be like, this job looks like it failed, done. <laughs> and then probably because we can't just let them run things forever, because most people just run jobs that are just like, let's just see what happens, or I think it failed, but let's just let it keep going, or because there's, there's no deterministic endpoint for most of our jobs. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a big part of this. Okay. So that's it. I just want to say the last slide. Fast growing field. We need computer scientists, people interested in infrastructure, and all these things. So we're really excited. Open to collaboration. <coughs> so you know, Michigan also has a great facility here. So it's a great place for anyone who is interested in sort of thinking about this because we can connect you straight to the raw data, to the pipelines, to the routines, but also to the analysis side. So, so thanks. Thank you. Very okay, thank you. Thank you. So, how many specialists in this work do you have? You and your female colleague? Uh, Melanie.